All right, praise the Lord. Boy, God is good, I'm telling you. I, I, that is such, boy, all of those songs are just so great. I'm gonna put this over here for you, hon. All these songs are just so dynamically good. I, I don't know if it's because we've missed them for a long time, you know? Even though we've, you know, we've, we have them on video and, and all of that, and thank the Lord that we do have technology and so forth to be able to, to capture all of these things and be able to use them in case of an emergency. But did everybody get their offering in, by the way? I forgot to say that to you, and I'm, I'm sorry. For when, I, when I saw uh, Jackie go up there and put the first offering in, I said, oh my goodness. I forgot to say during the songs, come put your offering in. You know? But I figure you, you probably know that anyway, right? You guys knew that. Yeah. Sometimes I forget, but you, you remember that. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Well, let's see if we can kick in on something from David today that'll speak to our hearts because uh, he has been doing that to me anyway. Um, as a matter of fact, I've had so much to say that I just... I just hadn't even been able to say it. You know, that's all it boils down to. And I hate to hold things over a lot of times because it, it, it kind of loses the dimension that I'm really wanting it to be when we share it all at one time. But uh, it's just so much, man. I, I'm serious. David is such a, David is such a, a living example of everything in the Christian life that's good and bad at the same time. I mean, he, he's so dynamic an illustration that uh, his life is so um, transparent. You know, Pastor Tanya read one of the Psalms out of Psalm 8. David, I, I know most people think David wrote all the Psalms, but he didn't. There are 150 Psalms in your Bible. David only wrote about half of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are 73 with his name on it. And then there are quite a few anonymous ones. Uh, Moses wrote some, uh, Solomon wrote some, uh, others, some, some anonymous people, Asaph wrote some, and then there are some that are anonymous, and, and he probably wrote some of those anonymous ones. But over half of the Psalms, or at least half of the Psalms that are in your book of, of Psalms were written by King David, which is tremendous because if you read them, you find, about, you find out about, about whom David trusted, what David thought about God, uh, what he thought about himself. He was so transparent and so humble. If you read any of the Psalms, we're gonna read today, we're gonna read the most famous one of all. If I, if I said, hey, what's the most famous Psalm of all? What would you say? Psalm what, 23? That would be the most famous. I mean, I know you know Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lamp on air. You know Psalm three. You know you, you know Psalm three where it talks about you know walking not in the counsel of ungodly, sitting in the way of sinners, standing in the way of you know you know that. But is, has there any has there been any psalm used more, even by people who don't even know the Lord, <laughs> than Psalm twenty three? Have you ever been to a funeral that Psalm twenty three wasn't spoken in somewhere throughout the thing? Probably not. Maybe a few here and there, but it's really great. And and it's just such a humbling and transparent uh, song, which, which tells you why David was a man after God's own heart. That actually is the reason why, why he is, is because he was, he was just so real before the Lord. And his heart was so true to God. Uh, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a pretender. He, he, didn't, he, you know, he didn't try to muster things up. He, he, was, he was live on the spot, and he was a man after God's own heart. Well, we've been using him as an example of greatness. And greatness God's way, not the world's way, I remind you. The world says, you know, if you have money, popularity, success, and blah, blah, uh, you're successful. You're great. They call you great. But that's not what God calls great at all. You know what God calls great? Someone who accomplishes the purpose for which he was created. Somebody that, uh, there's another word that, word that we Christians use for that a lot, to accomplish the will of God. That God has a will. God has a purpose for you. And, your, and, and his purpose for me and his purpose for you may be different in how it operates, but it always has the same big purpose and the same big purpose for all of us is that, is that uh, we are commissioned to bring God's way of thinking and God's way of acting 
into every corner of society on this earth. So let me just say that one more time. God's big plan, God's big purpose. You say, I don't know what God wants me to do about, and you can name some, some offshoot or some small issue or whatever that might be. But as far as the big picture, as far as what his purpose for all of us is, is God's purpose for all of our life is that we would bring God's way of thinking and God's way of acting into every corner of society on this earth. Now, that is a big job. I'm gonna tell you, that is a big job. And so God says, all right, let me tell you how to be great because it's gonna take great people to bring these great, this, to, to tackle this big, great job that I have for you. And so let me tell you how to be great. And so he begins, and I, I've been using David as, a, as an example of 10 ways to become great. And we've already gone through six and we'll do number seven today. Number one, great people become great on the battlefield. You become great by doing it, in other words. You don't become great by studying it or, uh, or sitting back and getting lectured about it. You actually become great when you get on the battlefield and you actually perform in great ways on the battlefield. Second truth, because everybody's not perfect. Because we all make mistakes. Every one of us make mistakes. A great person is someone who takes um, responsibility for the mistakes they make. You're not looking to pass it to somebody else. You're not trying to blame somebody else. You, you say, it's me, it, it's me, oh Lord. You know, that old, that old thought, it's, it, it's not my mother, not my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. That's taking responsibility. And not only do you take responsibility for it, you, you allow it to grow you in this experience. The things that you do you, that displease God, the things that you do that disappoint yourself, you not only take responsibility, but you allow those things to become teachers in your life so that you can rise above all of that misgiving failure that you have. Number three, the third truth about great people is that great people rise above the pain of their past. You're not ever gonna be great, and by great, you're never gonna accomplish what God created you for. You're not ever going to be able to bring his, his word and his way into this world if you can't get above the pain that you have suffered in your past. Because all of us have. You know, it's almost like talking about dysfunctional families. <laughs> I don't even know a functional family, totally. I mean, I guarantee you, every one of us have some dysfunction in our life. We're human beings, that's our problem. And we make mistakes, and we do things we said we wouldn't do, and we don't do things we say we are gonna do. I mean, there are all kinds of, of pains that that causes in our lives as we grow up, as we become adults. I mean, pain is every, so if you can't get over the pain of your past, then that pain is going to sink you and you're going nowhere in life. Great people also pay the price to be a worshiper. Great people worship the Lord. And they have to pay a great price in order to be a worshiper of the Lord. It takes a lot of time to be a worshiper. It takes a lot of effort to be a worshiper. It takes a lot, of, it takes a lot of, uh, of, of, of standing against accusation to be a worshiper. A lot of misunderstanding about you to be a worshiper. Yeah, you're one of those Holy Ghost freaks. You're one of those Jesus freaks. You're one of those charismatics. You know, charismatic. That's an inside joke. <laughs> I used to have some people in the... In a, <laughs> I used to have some people in a country church way up in the Delta that called them charismatics. They said, are you... Yeah, you know, because it's spelled C-H-A-R-I-S. So, so it's, 
It's charismatics. I said, no, it's charismatic, bro. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to accuse something, at least get it right, you know. A lot of insults. I mean, you, you don't just stagger in and worship God. Worship is a, prayer, is a prepared thing. Worship is, a, worship is something that you come to with intent, and you do it with intent. And then to be a great person, you also have to think positive thoughts and God-forward thoughts in your mind all the time. This is called, in the Bible, uh, thinking by faith. And it's what... Uh, Hebrews 11 says, uh, but without faith, it is impossible to, believe, to, to please God because whosoever comes to God must believe that he is and must believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So in order to have God-based thinking and faith-filled thinking, which is the only way I can become great, is I have to have thinking that is filled with faith. Without that, I cannot, not probably won't, but I cannot please God. Because I've got to believe two things. One, that God is, which means he is current, he is now, he is love, he is everything the Bible says. He is with me, he hasn't forsaken me. God is, not God was and God will be, but God is on the scene right now working in my life. Yeah, yeah. And I've got to believe that to live by faith, else I'll never do it. And I've got to believe that he is going to reward me for doing right things, godly things, faith things. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, look, if you want to have all of these things here, you're worried about your house, you're worried about what you're going to eat, you're worried about what you're going to clothe. You're going... He said, here's, here's how you do it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. In other words, do right, live right, focus right, please me, and I'll take care of everything in your life. I'll reward you. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's not a punisher, he's a rewarder. And then the seventh one today is great people admit weaknesses, and become accountable to others. Now, I'm going to broaden that for you. Can you get to the next slide? This is the broader version of that. I thought it needed to be a little more wordy than that because I know you guys like for things to be really wordy. So I want to talk to you. I broadened it out so you can see what I'm really talking about when I talk about being accountable and uh, Admitting your weaknesses and becoming accountable. All right, look, look, first line. Every great person is incomplete. Let, let, no, let me just stop there and have you say to your friend near you or mate, <laughs> I'm incomplete. Now, and, and, and I want you to say it now like you believe it because I want you to know that, that you are. You are incomplete. You know why you are incomplete? Because God has designed you that way. God has designed you with what I call divine disabilities. We have all been designed with a disability of some sort or another. None of us are complete in ourselves. The reason God did this is so that we would trust him and rely on others in our life. The whole Bible teaches this, guys. As an example, Moses. God spoke to him at a burning bush and said, Moses, I want you to go down there and say this to Pharaoh. Get, let my people go. Now, do you think that God knew he was going to ask Moses to do that when he created Moses? Sure he did. He created Moses like Moses was. And, and God knew that one day he was going to ask Moses to go down there and say this dynamic statement to Pharaoh. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was God, I would have fixed him where his voice would have sounded like the voice of many waters, like the archangel of God. 
But, do you, but you, do you remember what Moses said to God when he said that? The very first thing out of Moses' mouth was, but God, I don't talk so good. And he was right. He didn't talk good. God didn't even argue with him about that. He didn't say, oh, Moses, yeah, you talk right, son. It's all right. No, he didn't say, when Moses says, I don't talk good, God didn't even correct him whatsoever. God just asked him one question. Moses, who made your mouth? That's all he said. Who made your mouth? You know what God was saying? If you need to talk good, I'll make you talk good. Don't worry about it. But right now, you can't talk good. You know why he didn't, you know why God didn't make Moses where he could talk good? Because God didn't want some smooth-talking salesman to go down there and deliver Israel from Pharaoh. God wanted somebody that was incomplete so that when he got delivered, there, nobody would say, well, Moses talked him into it. I'm just saying we have all been designed by God this way. We are not complete on our own. Another example, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, the apostle of the entire New Testament, wrote uh, 17 books in the New Testament, only 27 in the whole, in the whole New Testament. This was the guy that, that built churches everywhere. He was the apostle of everything the greatest Christian missionary that's ever lived on the face of this earth. Most likely the most spiritual, godly person apart from Jesus Christ that's ever been on this earth. And yet the Corinthians, he started the, Corinthian, the church at Corinth, and then in the second letter of the Corinthians, the Corinthians sent a letter and said, to evidently talking to some other Christians and Paul happened to see it. And, and then Paul said, here's what I'm hearing that you're saying about me. It, it's, in, it's in chapter 10, verse 10, if you ever wanted to look it up. For this is, what, this is what the Corinthians were saying about the guy that started their church with his life and his blood and his integrity and everything and stayed there long enough to keep them going to become a church. He was their father in the ministry, the, 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 the apostle that sacrificed everything. Here's what they said about him. For his letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. You know what they were saying to the apostle Paul? Look, don't, you don't have to come down here and visit us anymore. Just send a letter because your letters are good. Your letters carry weight. Your letters are authoritative and powerful. But when you come down here, you know, you, you don't really speak very well. You got a squeaky little scrawny voice and you're ugly. You're not, you don't, you're not attractive in any way. So it would be better if you just sent your letter down and we would think that you were wonderful. That is the apostle of the New Testament church. Do, don't you think God knew that that's what Paul was going to be when he created Paul? Then why didn't he create him with the voice of Apollos? Or a wonderful, charming attitude of life and beautiful hair and eyes and lips and teeth. Why, why wasn't he dazzling to everybody? If he was going to be the apostle that started the church and, and, and fostered the church for all ages, why wasn't he more impressive than he was? Because God made him that way. God divinely disables us. We are created that way on purpose so that we will need God and we will need each other. So I feel a lot like Moses and Paul at times. I'm disabled. I, I am incomplete. Every great person is incomplete in their giftings, you don't have all the gifts. There, you, you have some gifts, but you don't have them all. None of us have all of them. That's why God says you're a body. You're an eye, you're a foot, 
you know, and your hair and your beautiful uh, uh, lips. I'm a big toe. This got gout. And um, I mean, we're all necessary. And without all of us, this body doesn't work. Read 1 Corinthians 12. It tells you all about it. It tells you, man, the eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The head can't say to the arm, I don't need you. The, the, the inside parts that we can't even see that are the parts that make us stay alive, like our liver and pancreas and all that kind of nasty, ugly looking stuff. It's more necessary than these beautiful eyes I have. Beautiful lips, beautiful hair. <laughs> No, no, see, you can live, see, see, now, you can live without this, huh? I can't live without my liver. Have you ever seen a liver? Ugly, ugly. But it's, it's even more necessary than the pretty parts. This is how God created us. We don't have all the gifts we need. We don't have all the personality we need. There are people that will not respond to me and they love you to death. You could sell them, you know, anything you had. They would look because they love you. You fit them. You are just, whoa, you're their kind of person. Whereas I might be the greatest person on the face of the earth and know everything they need to know, but they don't want me. They want you. We're incomplete. And intellect, I don't know everything. I mean, I know all y'all think I do, but I, I really don't. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know I'm kidding. Uh, my humility is my greatest asset, by the way. <laughs> I'm proud of my humility. Uh, yes, yeah. But, but God created us that way. And so, and so God created David as the king of Israel. He is considered the greatest king of Israel. He, he was the king of Israel about... I mean, just roughly in the ballpark of a thousand years before Christ. So for the last, for 3,000 years now, David has been considered the greatest king that Israel ever had in spite of all of his weakness. How did he do it? How did he do it? Well, he did it by two things. Number one, David surrounded himself with God and the people of God and he surrounded himself with people who were strong in areas that he was weak. Can, can I get an amen or something like that? I mean, I don't think you're really quite getting the, the, the crux of that. You are not strong enough. You are not gifted enough. You do not have enough personality. You don't know enough to do everything that God has for you in life. And he has created you that way on purpose. And he has put you into a body of believers and he says to you, if you want to be great, you have to first of all see your weaknesses, which is hard for some people to do because they try to hide them from everybody, even themselves. But you gotta see them, and then secondly, you have to gain around you, not only God himself, but people of God who are gifted and strong in some areas in which you are incomplete or you are weak in life. And this is how David did everything that he did. This is how David became successful, by doing this very thing. In the life of David, David had all kinds of people in his life that did great and mighty things that were all weaknesses in his life. And so if we're gonna be great, we're gonna have to do the same thing. So what kind of, what kind of, what kind of dependence do we need to have? Let me just hit them real quick. The, uh, dependence number one would be God. All right, I've gotta depend on God. David saw himself as a sheep and he saw God as the shepherd. Go to Psalm 21. You got it up there? Look at look, Psalm 23. Look at the first verse. Here's what David said. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
David says, all right, here is how I see God. I see God as my shepherd, and I see myself as a sheep. And anything that I need as a sheep is going to have to be supplied by the shepherd. Because we know some things about sheep, right? We know that sheep have no sense of direction. I mean, you've never heard of a homing sheep, right? Not, there's no homing sheep. Because they don't, they can't, they, they're not direct. I mean, sheep don't carry burdens, right? So we never heard of a pack sheep, all right? Sheep can't fight battles, so we've never heard of a bodyguard sheep. No, sheep are just helpless, um, confused uh, animals that have to be taken care of in every way in their life. And so David says, you know what I am? I'm a sheep, and God is my shepherd, and if I will allow God to be my shepherd, then look, everything else after verse 1, it comes into my life. If God is my shepherd, I mean, look at this. We're going to read it. If God is my shepherd and I'm his sheep, this is what my shepherd does in my life. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That means he finds the good green tender grass and he brings me right there and I get all I want. He leads me beside still waters because I'm too scared to drink out of stuff that, that moves around too much and I need to be at peace. And so he brings me somewhere where I can just get all the water I want. He restores my soul. He brings me back to life when I'm all broken down and worn out and torn up. He leads me in the paths of righteousness Righteousness, which means he teaches me how to do right things. That's what righteousness means for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the darkest things in life, the things that just scare me to death, I mean, the, the, the lack of money, the lack of jobs, my kids messing up, not knowing where I'm going to, my, I'm getting evicted from my house, all of the darkness of life, even the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not afraid because God's rod and his staff, his corrector and his punisher, his provider and his punisher, excuse me, his rod that pulls me back away from the edge of a cliff or away from the mouth of a lion or, and his staff, which can kind of give me a little attention every now and then. That makes me comfortable to know that he's watching me and that he's protecting me and he cares about what happens to me. <laughs> you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know what that is? That's God bragging on you. I know it doesn't sound like that. But what that preparing a table in the presence of your enemies means is that on the night before battle, the enemy's camp's right over there. You're right over here. They can hear everything that's going on in your camp. God sets a table and has a party so that the enemy can hear you having a party and get intimidated by the fact that you're not even afraid of him. You're over there having a party and we're going to have a battle next uh, tomorrow morning. That's what God provides in the very presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup, I don't get just a little bit. It runs all over me. And goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. And I get to live in God's house when I die. David said, if you will be dependent on God, God is your shepherd and you are the sheep, then the shepherd will supply everything that you need as his sheep. I just want to ask you one thing. Where, where are Saul, Saul's psalms? Say that three times. <laughs> where are Saul's psalms? Saul didn't write any psalms, did he? You know why? Because Saul didn't think he needed God. Saul was an arrogant, half-hearted, prideful king that felt like he knew more than God. He didn't write any psalms. Let me ask you, where are your psalms? If we looked at your life, could we find some psalms in your life? You know what? You know, you know where your psalms are written? In your prayer life and in your praise life. If you don't pray and you don't praise, let me tell you what you're doing. You're saying to God, I don't need you. I can handle this myself. The more you pray and the more you praise, 
the more you're saying to God, I can't do this without you, God. God, I need your help. If you don't do this, I'm a goner for sure. But if we're just cocky and arrogant and believe we can do it ourselves, we never pray, we never praise, we never talk to God, we never ask God. We don't have any psalms in our life. David's life is filled with psalms because he knew he needed God. Because he knew, I'm incomplete, I'm a failure, I, I'm weak, I, I have all these things in my life, God. You've got to come through, you've got to help me, you've got to go with it, you've got to do this in my life. And those are Psalms, and if you don't believe it, read the book of Psalms. All they are are songs where David is pouring out his heart and life to God. You're the greatest. You're the most. I can't live without you. Majestic is your name in all the earth. <laughs> I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff. So, dependence number one is we got to depend on God. Dependence number two is a godly spouse. Now, I'm going to pick this up because I'm falling into my trap all the time. A godly spouse. You know, David had eight, huh? I'll have to go upstairs. There it goes. David had eight wives in the Bible that are listed in the Bible. Now, God is not okay with eight wives. I just want you to know this. God did not ordain multiple wives. Even in the Old Testament, he did not ordain. This is not God's plan. But it was not unusual for the day for monarchs and rich, wealthy people to have multiple wives. So I'm not even going to kind of get off into that. I'm just going to say that was not God's plan for David. But in spite of that, in spite of that, David's wives gave him great counsel and he listened to them all the time. David was not too proud to listen to a woman. He did not think that his wives were dumb and didn't know anything. Michal, which is, we usually pronounce it Michael, but it's really pronounced Michal, who is Saul's daughter, was David's first wife. And she saved his life multiple times. One night when, the, when, when her daddy's soldiers were outside the house, she looked out the window and said, David, you better save yourself tonight because if you're not, you're not going to be alive in the morning. Yeah. And she opened the window and let him down and he went out the backside of the house and, and fled away. And then she took a little statue of him and put it in the bed and put some goat's hair up on the pillow. And when the guards came in, they said, she told them, David's in the sick, he's sick in the bedroom. And they went in there and looked and they saw you know, the little cover up mannequin and went back and told Saul. Saul said, well, go in there and get to bed and bring him in here on the bed, I'm gonna kill him on the bed. And when they went back, he, of course, he was not there. He was gone. It was just a fake. Hey, Abigail. Abigail was one of his wives. Beautiful woman, beautiful appearance. She had a wicked husband named Nabal. Was an honorary, wicked, evil demon of a man. Uh, David did some kindness for him. And then when it came time for Nabal to return the kindness, he was, he was ugly and, and angry and insulting and all of that kind of stuff. And David got his men and was going down there to kill everybody, kill Nabal and all of his sons and every man in the camp. And Abigail, Nabal's wife at the time, listened and she stopped David halfway down and she bowed before him and she pled for the life of her old wicked idiot husband. And, and, and David repented of that and said, no, I'm not going, okay, you, you saved your family. I'm not, I'll, I'll not do it. And David turned around and left. A few months later, Nabal dies, natural causes. David marries Abigail and she becomes a great wife to David. There was a young woman, I, well, I got a bunch of stuff I can say about it. Y'all get the point, right? The point is that you ha God's given you a godly mate for a reason. That's your partner. That's the person that God's given you to, to be in, uh, to be, to be in, in um, I, I want to say conference with, or to be, to be together, to make decisions and choices and, and to help each other. And and so we need to listen. This is, this is a tool. This is a person that God has given. And don't overrun them. If they say, no, I don't have peace about this, let it go. Say, thank you, God. 
If this is not right, I want you to change my spouse's life about, mind about this. And let it go. Don't say, oh, come on, baby. You know, oh, come on now. Look, we can do this. We, you know, and end up trying to talk your way into something. You know, Jesus didn't have a wife, but Jesus listened to women all the time in his ministry. There were lots of women in the ministry of Jesus that Jesus got information from and, and inspiration from and in every way took care of a lot of his life. I'm just saying godly men and godly women are that way. They depend on each other. God put us together, so he, he's given us all kind of gifts. Women don't look at life like men look at life. Women don't look at situations like men look at situations. I mean, we're different in so many ways, it's unbelievable. Not wrong, just different, okay? God did that for a purpose. Listen to your mate. Number three, third dependency is God's anointed ministers. God connects you in your spiritual life with a spiritual covering. Now, I know that you, you, may have, you might not have heard that. I don't know whether you have or not. Uh, 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 anything about a spiritual covering. Well, a spiritual covering is just somebody that God puts in your life in order to be his authority over you, his covering over you. Now, there are two passages of Scripture, both in Hebrews, and, and one is verse 7 and one is verse 17, and they almost say the same thing, and I'm going to read both of them. Look at what it says. Remember those who rule over you. And I put the word lead because that's what that means. Remember those that lead you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. God says you have a spiritual person in your life that God has placed there to lead you. And this person is going to lead you and you follow them because they're teaching you the word of God and they're leading you in the right direction. So don't be stubborn and lock your feet in and back up on them. Go with them. They are leading you. Verse 17, a little bit more wordy. Obey those who rule over you, lead you. And be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. In other words, God places spiritual people in your life who watch over your soul, that are concerned about your soul and your life. And when they lead you, be submissive to that because they're going to have to stand before God one day and give an account for this. And, and so when they do, make it where they can be happy and not sad when they have to talk about your life because if they have to be sad, it's going to be unprofitable to you. That's your covering. So, our third dependency would be to depend on those who God has placed in our life to lead us. Just a little brief comment. David, David's pastor was Nathan the prophet. David loved his pastor. David obeyed his pastor. When David's pastor came to talk to him about committing adultery with Bathsheba and having Uriah killed and lamb blasted him and just put him, woo, I mean, it was bad. David did not try to alienate Nathan. He did not try to fight back against Nathan. He listened to what Nathan said and he went to God and he listened to what his pastor said and because of that, God didn't take David's life. That was what God was gonna do. David had said, that guy needs to die and God said, okay, you just named your own fate right there. And then Nathan said, God, come on, you know. Let's, let's, and, and Nathan pled for him and God said, okay, I'm not gonna kill him but the sword's never gonna part from his house. And even on his deathbed, King David had to make a decision about who was going to be the next king of Israel. And, uh, and he listened to his pastor, Nathan, when Nathan told him, no, uh, let's let Solomon do this, which was obviously God's choice. So depend on God's anointed ministers. And then number four, close friends. All of us need friends. 
David had a friend, his closest friend was the son of King Saul. His name was Jonathan. That was David's best friend. He loved Jonathan to death. And Jonathan kept David alive many times because Jonathan knew what his dad was doing and kept while his dad was trying to hunt David and kill David. And Jonathan was a very good friend of his and very helpful in his life. He trusted Jonathan for advice and, and counsel. Proverbs 12, 26 says, the righteous, listen to this, the righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Here's 1 Corinthians 15, you know this one. Don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now, do you know what both of those are saying? They're saying the same thing. They're saying that in this world we live in, there is such a thing as peer pressure. Have you heard of peer pressure? Sure you have. There is good peer pressure and there is bad peer pressure. Bad peer pressure leads you away from the wisdom of God and leads you away from things that are going to bless your life. Good peer pressure encourages you to do those things that are beneficial to you and, and chastises you when you step out of bounds. The Bible is telling you it matters who you hang around with. Choose wisely. Bad people in your life are going to lead you down the wrong road. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You've heard me say this before. You show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Because your friends decide your future. It's amazing for me to think that some little pimply-faced uh, kid that don't even have their wisdom teeth yet have more of an influence over my grandchildren than I do. Who could tell them almost everything positive and help them in every way and keep them out of trouble and keep them going the right direction. But no, no, they don't listen to me. It's those peers that's why you have to choose wisely. Close friends. You have to choose friends with the same values, with the same, with the same goals in life and the same values. And if you don't, it's going to lead you astray. And then number five is wise counselors. Joab was one of David's commanders. Joab constantly kept David out of trouble. Joab was his main general. There was only one time when David did not listen to Joab, and that's what I'm going to be preaching about next week. Only one time did David not listen to wise counsel, and it messed him up. It was a big, it was a big mess. So we need to surround ourselves with wise counsel, with close friends that match our goals in life and our ambitions in life, anointed ministers, godly spouse, God himself. Now, here are the two obstacles that keep us from making good dependence choices, and I'm just going to say them because I ain't got time. Number one is pride. Pride keeps us from choosing uh, good, dependable people in our life. Pride I'm going to just give you a definition, is a worldly, humanistic confidence in our own ability that won't admit weakness. Pride is a worldly, humanistic confidence in our own ability that will not admit weakness. So pride is what keeps me from admitting the fact that I need help in life. Saul never admitted anything Wrong. That's why God took the kingdom away from him. He was an arrogant, prideful man, and God gave the kingdom to David, who was humble and transparent and knew that he needed God's help. He was a sheep, and God was a shepherd. That's what happens. The Apostle Paul, I don't have time to read the scripture, but I know you'll remember it. The Apostle Paul is a perfect example of somebody who, who, who had a reason to be proud, but surrendered his pride and said, you know, um, 
I, I can't do anything by myself and God, without God, I am, I am lost. And uh, his strength, I prayed three times for the thorn to be gone and God said, no, I'm not taking it, but, but I'm gonna, but I'm gonna uh, uh, make you strong in this weakness. And the apostle Paul concluded by saying, um, therefore now I, I glory in my infirmities and I'm, I, I'm proud of my weaknesses because when I am weak, he's strong. So pride, pride will keep you from doing it. I mean, look, you, you won't listen to people. You won't get people in your life. You won't choose people. You won't let anybody be your covering. You're stubborn. You know why you are? Pride. Just pure old pride is all it boils down to. You won't do things for the Lord. You won't let yourself be a little loose about God. There are people that won't even worship the Lord. You know why? Not because they don't think God deserves it, but they're too proud. When they raise that hand, somebody might look at them and go, look at them. And they're so proud they won't even raise their hand. Somebody might say something about them. Second obstacle is insecurity. Insecurity means I think I'm defective. I think something's wrong with me. And so I think I'm always gonna be like this. It's very hard to tell it from pride because most of the time, you know where we hide our securities? Behind whatever we think is the strongest thing in our life. Am I right about this? Sometimes you can't see somebody's insecurity or you don't judge it as insecurity. You know why? Because it's hidden behind something that I consider to be a strength in my life so that hopefully you can't see it. Like for some people, they, their money is the most powerful thing in their life. So they hide their insecurity behind their money and everything gets to be about them paying and them showing their gifts and their show, and all that is is hiding that insecurity. Some people, it's their looks. Some people, it's their physical abilities. Their athletic abilities. I mean, people hide things all the time. But, but God says, no, you gotta, look, you, gotta, you gotta come out from behind all that because that's gonna be a destruction in your life, insecurities. So let me, let me just have you bow with me real quick.